Thank you everyone for joining us today for the webinar, Communicating in the Professional World. I'm Karina Garnas from the UNH Office of Alumni Relations, and I'm joined today by Amy Bleasing. Amy is, the sen is a senior lecturer in acting, voice, and movement in the UNH Theater and Dance Department. Amy will walk us through some useful tips and tricks to expand our professional communication skills. Amy is a performance educator with a background in acting and directing. She specializes in vocal technique for performance and public speaking. Having worked extensively with actors and business people over the years, Amy is dedicated to helping others find more power and productivity in their voice and speech at work and in everyday life. Amy will be asking everyone to practice some of the techniques today. Don't worry, none of us can hear or see you. So I'd like to encourage you to sit back, participate in the activities, and don't worry about taking notes. We'll be sending a follow-up email containing Amy's presentation <coughs> with any um, resources and links. And if you have any questions throughout the presentation, please go ahead and type them into the Q&A box that you'll find at the bottom of the screen. Amy will respond to your questions at the end of the presentation. And with that, I will turn it over to Amy. Thanks, Karina. So communicating in the professional world, it can be daunting, it can be nerve inducing, complicated. For some people, it's just not fun. So I've got a few things here that you may have experienced. Anxiety, nerves, lack of confidence, difficulty focusing, trouble filling a room with your voice, difficulty keeping people's attention, quiet or difficult to hear voices or loud or overbearing voices, difficulty understanding due to mumbling or filler words, ums and ahs, vocal fry, upspeak. All these things have solutions and I'm going to share some key ways to help you begin to overcome them. So as Karina said, my name's Amy Bleasing. I'm a senior lecturer in the theater and dance department here at UNH. I'm also a certified trainer of LESAC voice and body training. Uh, I'm a professional actor, director, and singer, and I have been teaching for over 15 years. I've been working with actors, primarily working with them on communicating as actors, but I also have had a number of professional and business clients who I've worked with on public speaking and voice and speech training. So what do I do? I essentially teach people how to become aware of what their voices and bodies are doing that's getting in the way of their success. I teach people how to overcome those issues by creating a new awareness of the things that can actually help them. How do I do that? Well, I bring your attention to your voice and your body and the tools that you already actually have to use your voice and body well. So we're going to be talking about four things today, presence and posture, better breathing, speaking skills, and communicating to connect. So before we get into all that, I'd like to take uh, a couple of moments to just share some quotes with you. And I want you to just take these in and keep them in the back of your mind as we go through the presentation today. So this one is from Professor Deborah Kinghorn who is a master teacher of LESAC kinesthetic voice and body training. And she's also one of my colleagues in the theater and dance department here at UNH. She says that tone of voice provides information and also has a direct physical impact on our bodies. Good vocal tone is like a magnet drawing people together rather than pushing them apart. And this next quote, we form our opinions of someone we meet for the first time in just a few seconds. And this initial instinctual assessment is based far more on what we see and feel about the other person than on the words they speak. On many occasions, we form a strong view about a new person before they speak a single word. So these two quotes 
are really the essence of why I teach what I teach and why what I teach is rooted in your awareness. If you're not aware of what's going wrong, it's very difficult to change it. And at the same time, if you're not aware of the tools that can help you, how can you use them to transform? So the very first thing that we're going to look at is presence and posture. So your posture and your body language matter. People will respond to you based on your physical presence, and they will even from time to time reflect the body language that you emit. And that can be a good thing or it can be a bad thing, depending on what your body language is saying. So your posture or your alignment, the energy that you bring into a room, how you carry yourself, these are super important in those first few seconds before you even speak. So I want you to take a look at these five different uh, physical postures, let's call them. And I'm gonna ask you in a moment to respond in your chat to how you would describe each of these five postures. Now, they might, you don't have to respond to all of them. There might be one that you have an instant reaction to. Think of it in terms of if this person walked into the room like this, what would you instantly think of them? The other way you can think of it is um, if you were actually experiencing that physical posture. So you can go ahead and play with, what does it feel like to have my arms crossed? What does it feel like to have my hands dropped in my lap, my head forward? Just go ahead and spend a moment looking at these and then pop some words into the chat of your interpretations of what these different postures tell you about people. So two looks confrontational and defensive. Two closed minded. Five looks upset or demanding. Wow, great. Two is angry. Two and five seem confrontational. Three is nervous. Three, nervous, shy, one standing firm, one open, ready, one is neutral, five, confident. Good. So there's a lot of different uh, interpretations here, which is fantastic. Uh, thank you all so much. Oh, number three, look scared. Yeah, that's a really good. Yeah, number two, I don't believe a word you're saying. Yep. Five, thoughtful, but not present. Three, shame. Interesting. So notice that... Um, these people don't even have faces and we can already judge them just based on what they're physically doing. They're not, we can see it. We see it straight away and we see that because we're human. Okay. And we respond to other human beings behavior. We just know we don't have to think about it. So how you carry yourself uh, tells us something about you, whether it's true or not your posture and your body language broadcast something about you. And so you want that broadcast to be good. Your everyday posture is essentially your home base for everything else that you do physically. So depending on where you begin in terms of just your everyday way of carrying yourself, that's going to really impact your body language. So without going into too much detail on body language, generally, Open gestures are more welcoming. They invite people to connect with you and they make you seem more approachable. Closed gestures like crossing your arms, having your hands on your hips or in your pockets can look and feel resistant and it can seem like you're not really open to discussion or new ideas. What you want to have is an overall feeling of balance and ease in your body. That will allow you to relax, for more open and organic body language. It helps you to, to seem more approachable, more engaging, and it helps you to actually be more connected to the people that you're with. So that's great, but how do we get there? Well, that's what we're gonna talk about. So we're gonna start with looking at um, posture. We're gonna do some myth busting today because there's some, there's some popular beliefs about things like posture and breathing that are actually not very helpful. So the myth of posture traditionally is that good posture means that we have our shoulders back, our chest up and our chin up. Um, this is also known as military posture. In the acting world, I refer to this as bluff, which already doesn't sound great. This is not a great posture for everyday use. 
So let's just explore this. Let's everyone, uh, wherever you're sitting or standing, go ahead and feel what it feels like to pull your shoulders back, puff your chest up and, and bring your chin up. Okay, chest out, chin up, shoulders back. We can probably all hear a grandparent or aunt or uncle telling us these things when we were young. And I want you to notice with this posture, can you breathe easily? Can you feel tension when you try to take a breath? And then I'm gonna let you go ahead and release that. I think I know most of your answers. The problems with this kind of posture, number one, for the body, it creates tension. And tension is what I would call an anesthetic experience, which means that it's deadening any helpful sensations in the body that help us to communicate with ease and make genuine connections with people. In terms of your voice, this kind of posture tightens your throat and neck, which in turn is gonna tighten the voice. And if I really engage in this posture, you can hear how it changes the quality of my voice. It's gonna make it really difficult for us to speak clearly and easily. In terms of communication, this kind of posture creates a sense of disconnect. It kind of puts up a barrier or a shield between you and the people that you're with, and it makes people resistant to you. It can even make people nervous to be around you because it can seem really intimidating. So none of that is ideal if you're trying to make connections with people. The flip side of this, is another kind of posture, which is actually the result of people not having posture that's really good or really upright. Um, so this is kind of the opposite problem. This is um, what I would call a retreat posture. Okay, so this is where posture is rounded and sunken. The shoulders kind of fold into the body. The head might be low or the chin might be jutting forward. If you're standing, this might be the kind of posture where you're, you put all of your weight into one foot. So you're kind of uh, off balance all the time. So once again, I'm going to ask you to go ahead and feel what that feels like. If you round your shoulders in and kind of collapse your head forward, stick your chin out a little bit and just feel that. And again, I want you to, I want you to really go there and I want you to experience, can you take a full breath here? Can you take an easy, relaxing breath here? And again, I'm pretty sure I know the answer. Um, <laughs> it's not ideal. So this kind of alignment creates a different set of problems, which is kind of like it's a different kind of anesthetic for the body. In the body, this kind of posture creates a kind of deadening energy or a low energy, and it draws your attention in so that it's actually harder to connect with other people because your attention is actually moving in the direction of your body. It's moving in. You're also physically showing people that you're with that you wish you were somewhere else. Okay. If I'm sitting here talking to you like this, it really doesn't look like I'm interested in being here. In terms of your voice, this kind of alignment is going to stress your voice in a different way. It stresses the muscles of the throat and the neck because they're pushing forward and you can hear that change in my voice again. It makes it harder to speak easily and freely. In terms of your communication, people have to work really hard to try to connect with you when you have this kind of alignment. Because as, you, as I said before, this is kind of what I call the retreat posture or the closed off posture. So someone has to really want to try to connect with you in order to get through. And in some cases, they might just ignore you. You might just become invisible to them. So this is a real definite problem if you're a participant in trainings or meetings and you want people to, to know that you're a team player and that you're engaged. But it's an even bigger problem if you're leading or presenting because the people watching you are seeing you kind of appear to not really want to be there. What we want is healthful alignment and I'm gonna shift away from posture right now because posture tends to indicate like a rigidity, like that military posture we talked about or that bluff posture. So we're gonna we're we're transform our term now into alignment. 
So healthful alignment allows for freedom of movement. It allows our body language to come more easily and freely, and it keeps us grounded and at ease. It allows our voice to have a more clear pathway when we communicate. It helps us to feel more connected to others and it makes it easier to breathe. Now, your posture or your alignment and your breathing actually work together. So if you have optimal alignment, and we'll play with that in just a moment, if you have optimal alignment, you're more able to breathe optimally. At the same time, if you're breathing well, you're more likely to have good alignment or a sense of balance in the body. We're gonna explore how to find your optimal alignment in a few moments, but first I wanna look at breathing and do some myth busting there as well. So in terms of breathing, sometimes we get so absorbed in the information that we're trying to get across that we can forget to breathe. If you're not breathing, people will find it very difficult to listen to you because you're essentially holding your breath and talking on no air, which makes it really difficult for people to listen to. If you can allow yourself to take a breath here and there when you're speaking, and this is particularly if you're um, a public speaker or if you're running a meeting or if you're doing a presentation, trust that you have the time to take a breath and that you will be able to deliver the information that you have. Often we don't breathe because we're worried about time or we're worried that people aren't listening. But I can pretty much guarantee to you that if you're not breathing, people will check out because it's just so hard to listen to someone that, to listen to someone that has no breath. Breathing has a ton of benefits, but some of the really important ones for us to note right now are that, well, number one, breathing keeps us alive, which is very helpful. Breathing relaxes us, it energizes us. So it's what we call, uh, in terms of the LESAC work, we call this a relaxer energizer. It can relax and energize us at the same time. Breathing helps us to think clearly. And you can try this by holding your breath and trying to think up something really productive. Um, you can also try just holding your breath and notice what happens in terms of your focus and your brain. Um, and what you usually will find is that everything kind of just stops. So the breathing helps you to think clearly. Now, the myth of deep breathing, um, this is kind of related to when someone tells you to take a deep breath, right? So it might be, I always think about being a child in the doctor's office and taking a deep breath and your shoulders come up and your chest puffs out and, and you're essentially doing what a deep breath must look like. Now, the problem with this kind of breath where we raise our shoulders and puff the chest out is that essentially we're breathing into the smallest part of the lung, okay? The lungs are smaller at the top than they are at the bottom. And unless you've been taught how to breathe well through other modalities, this, this tends to be the default deep breath. What it actually does though is it creates tension it creates tightness in the chest and therefore in the throat and the neck. And it can actually increase anxiety because it's, it's very similar to a fear breath. <sighs> if we're afraid of something, we breathe up high. So this is not an ideal way to take a deep breath. And we all know that breathing is good for, excuse me, for relaxation. But if we're breathing wrong, it's not going to help us. Breathing into this shorter, smaller part of the lung means that we're getting less air. As I said, it creates tightness, it increases anxiety, and it stops us from actually feeling grounded. So it's useful to remember that the lungs are bigger at the bottom, and that's where we want to fill our breath, from the bottom up, in the same way that we fill a bucket, from the bottom to the top. So, Let's explore this for a moment um, in terms of how do we feel the ideal breath and alignment together that is relaxed and at ease and that helps you feel calm and present. So I'm going to ask you to join me for an activity here. I want you to imagine the smell of something you really enjoy and it could be the smell of a flower. If you have something near you, like a cup of coffee or tea that you can actually smell, you can use that as well. 
But if you don't have something with you, just use your imagination and think about something that you love the smell of. You can close your eyes if you'd like to. Sometimes it helps us to connect with our imagination a little better if we close our eyes. But I want you to smell that smell that you love just really easily. Breathe in that smell that you really enjoy and just let the breath fall out of the body. And then smell it again. Just really allow yourself to enjoy the smell and start to notice what you feel in the body. Now, if the sense of smell doesn't work for you, you can imagine an environment that you enjoy, like the beach or the forest or a lake. And just imagine that you're breathing in the air in that environment. Do make sure that you breathe out fully as well. So taking a few breaths like this, just smelling that beautiful thing and exhaling fully, allowing yourself to notice what's happening in the body. What you might notice, and if you'd like to uh, go back to your normal breathing pattern now, that's fine. What you might notice is that there's minimal to no movement in the shoulders. You might notice that you're actually feeling the lungs fill from the bottom. You might notice some movement in the ribs or the lower back. You might feel the weight of your head lift as you exhale. And you can test it again on, on a breath at any time. You can always just check back in with that smelling breath. You might also even feel the sense of the spine wanting to lengthen and the body releasing tension as you breathe out. This is your body responding to a healthful breath. Now, if you haven't if you've been using that sense of smell for a while now, I'm going to ask you to stop because if we do it for too long, we can be taking in a little too much oxygen. So this is good to do just a few times and then release it. So your body is actually responding to a healthful breath. It's trying to bring you into alignment. So essentially what your body is doing when you're breathing in this way is it's actually trying to help you find good alignment through breathing. And I pretty much have already said this, but this is essentially how you take a healthful, deep breath. So I'd love you to just take a moment now to pop some words in the chat of any of the sensations that you felt in the body then when you were smelling that beautiful smell. So go ahead and just drop in focused, beautiful. Relaxed, great. Peace, calm, relaxation, centered. Calm, great. Full, tired, yeah. It's, very, it's similar to when we yawn. We take a really full breath when we yawn. Alert, lengthening, great, focused, calm. Yeah, these are all words that I would expect. Peaceful, awakened, present, centered. All the tension immediately released, fabulous. Safe, letting go, knowing. These are great, fabulous descriptions. Thanks, everyone. Now. Even me just reading these responses to you should make you kind of feel like, wow, th this is a good thing. These are all the things that we want to feel when we're communicating. So we're going to play a moment now with alignment. Okay, so we've just explored how to take a full, lovely breath. Oh, someone else just commented they felt, felt movement in the chest, eyes got relaxed. Really good. That's lovely. So let's look now at alignment. So this is another activity for you. So what I'm going to have you do, whether you're sitting or standing, you can do this. I'm going to address both. Just play with whatever you'd like. If you're standing, you want to balance your feet under your knees, under your hips, so that the hip, knee, and ankle joint are aligned. And it's essentially the same alignment if you're sitting. If you're standing, you want to have your knees unlocked, so a little bit of softness in the knees. And if you're sitting, you want your knees bent at a right angle. If you're standing, you want to feel as though the sacrum, the base of your spine or the tailbone is reaching a little bit towards the floor. If you're sitting, you want to be on your, what we call the sits bones, which are the two little bones in your rear. And to feel them, you're gonna rock gently from side to side and you'll feel those little bones. You want to be sitting up on those bones. 
whether you're standing or sitting, now I'd like you to feel that your spine can lengthen up, just like these little stacking blocks, that your spine is lengthening up, up, up into the base of the skull. You can feel a sense that the belly button is just gently pulling towards the spine. You're not pulling it in. There's just a little sense of that it's drawing towards the spine. And if you're sitting, this is a little bit harder to feel in sitting, but it's the idea of not letting your belly just kind of tip out over your pelvis. So you're up on your sits bones and you're just, just keeping the belly moving uh, into the body. So a little bit of a, um, little bit of a curving inwards. Feel that your shoulders can hang really easily with your arms released by your sides and feel your head easily balanced on top of the spine. And you can nod your head and shake your head no a few times just to feel a little release and then let that go and find a balanced place for your head on top of the spine. And you want to feel a sense that energy is moving up the spine, up through what we call the crown of the head. So it's moving up and out the top of your head, but the energy is also moving down the spine, down through the sacrum, down towards the floor. Now with this alignment in place, I'm going to ask you again to smell that beautiful smell that you loved. It's this breath that helps us to allow our alignment to be fluid and flexible and not rigid. And that's really important, especially when we're exploring this for the first time. Sometimes this can feel a little strange at first because we're essentially placing you into a new alignment. Now, the way that we take it out of feeling rigid and feeling kind of like you're holding yourself here is using the breath. So we wanna use the breath to feel a little bit more fluidity in the body. And as I just said, the breath is really important to make sure that we don't get rigid. We can use our breath as a guide, okay? Um, if you can play with this kind of uh, alignment and breath work for five minutes a day, sometimes even less, it's going to start to feel really familiar and it's going to start to feel normal and essentially that is where you want your home base to be in terms of your physical posture or your physical alignment. You want to have that sense of lengthening up, lengthening down, that you can take a full easy breath at any moment. So a useful catchphrase for this kind of breathing is smell the flower, okay? In the Lesac world, we, we talk about smelling the flower. Now, your smell might not be a flower, that doesn't matter. It's just a little catchphrase that you can use for yourself. So the times to use this kind of breath are any time when someone would say to you, take a deep breath, okay? So if you're feeling that you're getting tense, smell the flower, lengthen the spine, release the shoulders. When you feel your posture slipping, and tension creeping in. Smell the flower, lengthen the spine, release the shoulders. When you feel anxiety or nerves creeping in, when you're running out of breath during a presentation or a speech, smell the flower, lengthen in the spine and release the shoulders. What this is going to do is it's going to help you come back to that place where you feel grounded and you feel that you're actually at ease. So in the body, you've got more freedom to move easily and openly. Your body language will become much more easy and organic because your, your home base is at ease. In terms of your voice, your body is now ready to allow the voice to function well. And in terms of your communication, you're going to feel more focused, more confident, and more ready to speak and engage with people. So we're going to explore now how the voice and the body come together, because in the same way that breath and posture or alignment work together, the voice and the body work together as well. So we're gonna look now at speaking skills. So many ways that our voice can help us or hinder us 
Um, there are many ways that our voice can help us or hinder us. Um, and the things that I hear most often when I'm listening to people, and this is, this is true for actors, for public speakers, for people presenting, and even just people in uh, conversation, the things that I hear most often are things like mumbling, talking too fast, de-energized voice or a monotone sort of quality, too quiet, too loud, filler words, lots of ums and ahs, general disconnection, vocal fry and upspeak. Now, when these things take over, that's when they make it difficult for people to listen to us. We want to actually enjoy speaking. Many of us don't, okay? Well, I do. Many of you may not enjoy speaking. So your voice plays a really big part in communication, obviously, because speaking is using your voice, but it also plays a huge part in how you feel. The vibrations of the voice can actually help you to feel more confident, more present, more able to communicate your intentions. Just like the breath, it relaxes and energizes you. On the flip side, if you're not using your voice at its best, it can actually contribute to feeling self-conscious, to feeling shy, to feeling anxious or feeling tense. So you really want to build an awareness of what your voice feels like. Having more awareness of how to use your voice well is going to lead to you feeling good about the sound of your voice. And it's also going to enable you to achieve positive results when you're communicating. So I'm going to ask some rhetorical questions now because there's quite a few of them, but I just want you to think about your responses to these next questions. How do you normally introduce yourself? Do you energize your name so that people will remember it or do you say it really quickly so you can get it over with, which pretty much makes sure that no one will remember who you are? When you talk to people, are you focused on the key ideas that you want them to take away? Or do you tend to give everything the same value and make it hard for them to really listen and stay engaged because you're kind of just saying everything on one note? Is the first time that you speak for the day when you answer the phone for the first time or maybe when you start that really important 9 a.m. meeting with a new client? Do you often feel like your voice is croaky or craggly in the morning? Like it takes half the day for you to actually feel like your voice has switched on and that it's working. Well, it doesn't have to be that way. So you can actually warm up your voice in the same way that you warm up your body by uh, going for a jog in the morning or doing yoga, or even just when you wake up in the morning and, and yawn and stretch your body. It's really easy to warm up your voice and get ready for the day. And I'm going to show you a few ways that you can actually do that. The first one is humming. Now, I don't mean a musical hum. This is just, it's just a hum, okay? Humming is an excellent way to warm up your voice. It's one of the easiest sounds to make. It's a sound that we actually use every day, okay? So when we like food, we say, mmm when we're thinking about something, sometimes we'll go, hmm. When we're amused by something, we might go, hmm. So this is a sound that is familiar. It's not some sort of weird alien sound that I'm introducing to you as a voicey person. So how do you do it? How do you do this with intention, with the intention to warm up your voice? So I'm gonna have you play with this um, as I go through this. What you're going to do is you're going to just play the sound Mm, okay, and you do that by just letting the lips come together. You don't want to press them too hard together. Think of the lips like two little cushions, and they're just going to go, hmm, hmm, hmm. And notice where you feel vibration or buzzing. Hmm, hmm. Go ahead and play with opening and closing your teeth while you hum. Mm. You'll probably feel vibration moving into different parts of the oral cavity. You can also play with pushing your lips forward and then relaxing them. So, mm, 
And again, you'll probably feel that vibration moves into different parts. Playing with um, different notes or just playing with pitch range. So things like, if you, if you like to sing, you can even just hum to songs that you like. But essentially what you're looking for is where do you feel the vibrations when you hum in these different ways. And what you want to do when you're using this as a warm up is you want to extend the hum to the end of the breath. So take a breath and then continue. The aim of a hum is to feel vibration on the lips and in the bones of the face. So the nasal bone, uh, the nasal bone, the cheekbones, the jaw and the forehead up into the top of the head. Okay. Why? Why do we want to feel vibration there as opposed to in our throat? Well, as you can see from this little uh, animation here, the, these bones that I just mentioned are essentially the external surfaces of what we call the resonating cavities in the head. So behind these surfaces, behind the nasal bone, the cheekbone, the forehead, and the jaw are the spaces where vibration is actually growing inside of uh, the head. Um, your throat, if you look at the animation here, you can see that the throat uh, is where the vibrations originate. So the vibrations of your voice begin with the vocal folds vibrating and then move up through into the resonating cavities. The thing about that though, is that if you look at the animation, you can see that in the throat, it's mostly soft tissue. So there's not actually anything to create what we call resonance. In the same way that a violin is made of wood and that wood is what vibrates and creates the resonance of the sound of the violin. Um, for us, the, the cavities that vibrate are uh, the, the sinus and the oral cavities. So once these vibrations reach these cavities, what we're actually experiencing is what we call bone conducted resonance. And this is essentially where the vibration that starts with the vocal folds turns into sound, it turns into actual sound. So if you think back to that violin uh, idea, if we take the body of a violin away and just play the strings, there's no sound because there's nothing to actually resonate. It's the body of the violin that, that is creating the sound itself. So because of that, that's where we want to focus our awareness in terms of where we're feeling vibration. We want to feel it, yes, in the lips, but we also want to feel it in the bones. And we can, you can even feel it on the outside. If you hum and just touch the bones of your face, you can often feel the vibration that way as well. Now, the cool thing about humming Apart from the fact that it's great for your voice, you can hum anywhere, okay? You can hum in an elevator, you can hum on the bus, you can hum in the car, in the shower, you can hum when you're walking from the subway to the office. And the reason you can do all those things is because it doesn't have to be loud. It just has to be intentional. So if you think about being on a bus, there's a lot of noise from the engine of the bus and the movement of the bus and other people. So if you're sitting on the bus just going, no one's going to notice that you're doing anything. What you know, though, is that you're warming your voice up and trying to build some of that vibration. There are four really good sounds to hum on. And when I talk about humming, I'm really talking about sustaining a consonant sound. Okay, so mm is the most obvious one. N. V, v, and Z. Z. These are four really fabulous sounds to warm up the voice. And they each are going to give you a slightly different experience of vibration. That's why they're good for warm ups because you're actually, uh, you're touching on more different sounds that you'll use. Five minutes of humming a day can honestly work wonders. It can help you clear away the croakiness and the like the mucus of the morning. It actually helps you feel more energized and ready the first time that you speak. Over time, it can build richness in your voice. 
It can also build your overall vocal awareness of the sounds that occur in speech. So the more you hum with intention in terms of warming up your voice, the more vibration you're going to feel. So each day you'll feel a little bit more vibration. The reason this is helpful is that you're building awareness of your voice through humming intentionally. That's really important. And what that does is that it can ultimately help you to slow down if you have a tendency to rush because you're aware of the sounds of speech that you're feeling. It'll improve the overall volume of your voice because you're actually getting more vibration in these resonating cavities. It'll help you to moderate any of the nerves or anxiety that you have around speaking because vibration, the vibration of the voice relaxes you and also energizes you. It can help you get out of any mumbling ruts that you might be in. So if you have a tendency to mumble, if you're feeling the sounds of speech more clearly, that's going to help you to not mumble because you'll be clearer. It also helps you to communicate more clearly and have more impact because of all those things that I just listed. So the next warm up activity that you can play with is saying your ABCs. This is actually a really fun one and it's fabulous because it provides you with a, a, a real treasure trove of different sounds that you can warm your voice up with and all these different sounds you're going to use during the day. So how do we do this one? How do I use my ABCs? Well, you're not just going to sit there and say A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P, because that's not intentional. Just like humming, it has to be intentional. So here's what you're going to do. And you can go ahead and do this with me. You want to say the sounds of the alphabet slowly and with energy so that you can explore where the different vibrations are on each sound. So for example, a, B, C, D, E, F, G, etc., etc. What you'll notice is that some sounds have more vibration than others. So sounds like L, M, N have a lot more vibration. Some sounds have both voiced vibration and unvoiced vibration, like S. F, T, P. And it's important for you to feel those different things as part of your warm up because those sounds occur in your everyday speech. You can play with different inflection for a little bit of fun with your ABCs A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J. And then, as well as warming your voice up, you're also actually. Um, improving musicality in speech, which is a really, uh, it's a really important part of communication is having a bit of musicality in your speech. You can also play, depending on how playful you want to get, you can play with different intentions. So you can play with the ABCs as though you're actually communicating to someone. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P, Q, R, S, T, U, V. It can be playful, okay? It's important that it's playful because if it's work or if it feels like it's not fun, then you're actually not going to get much out of it. If you're enjoying it and if there's intention and if there's this little sense of play with it, you will get more out of it. If you play through the alphabet a few times with any of these different techniques that I've just talked through, you're giving yourself a really nice, well-rounded vocal warm-up. The only caveat is this one's a little bit trickier to do in public, okay? You don't really want to be doing this one on the bus or on the train or walking down the street. This is one that you want to do at home, in the shower, in the office, or in your car. Now, warming up with your ABCs is helpful for general overall vocal life, but this is also a really helpful one for mumbling because again, it's bringing your attention to all of the sounds of speech. And our body is really incredible. Once we start to become more aware of the sounds of speech and we're intentional about them, our body wants to keep them. And so it starts to actually insert them into our speech without us even having to think too much about it. It's quite incredible. The third activity that I'm going to share with you that's a great warm up 
is using keywords or practicing the keywords that you say every day. So this is about the important words that you use in a day that you really need to have energy for or awareness for because they're important. So what are keywords? When I talk about keywords, I'm talking about things like the names of people or places, greetings, the way that you greet people, perhaps for a meeting, for a presentation, or on the phone, if you have a consistent phone uh, greeting that you need to use. Company names, products, projects, systems, words that you use or words that you talk about on a daily basis, or things that you'll be using specifically in a presentation or meeting particularly words with difficult pronunciation. So if you have research that, has, that um, is about words that are big and complicated, you wanna use those words as part of your vocal warm up to make sure that you can say them clearly and easily. So how do you do it? Okay, how do you warm up your keywords? So in the same way that we did with the ABCs, we're gonna slow everything down so that it becomes more intentional and more aware. You're gonna slow the word down and exaggerate the sounds of the word. Each time you do this, you're gonna play with the word a slightly different way until you ultimately return to saying the word in a more natural way. So I'm gonna show you how this might work. And I'm just going to use an arbitrary thing like company name. Company name is my key word. So I'm gonna slow it down and exaggerate it. Company name, company name. So I'm exaggerating it, I'm playing with it a few different ways. Company name, k -k 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 -comp -p 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 name, company name, company name, company name, company name, company name. And then I come to how I would say it in, in real life. I'm not going to walk into a meeting and go, company name. That would be silly, okay? It's just a warm up. And it's a warm up to make sure that you're feeling all of the sounds in the word so that you can energize them and so that you can communicate them clearly. What you will likely feel is that the word becomes more engaged and it sounds and feels much, much brighter, which is really uh, useful particularly um, when you have words that you need to have impact. Now, if you don't have specific words in mind, if there aren't any particular words that you can think, well, I don't really use words like that on a daily basis, you can use things that are around you. So you can just look around the room and name different things, um, playing with you know, the different things that you might see in the room or on your trip to work. I'll often play as I'm driving down the road, I just, pull out, I name the things that I see down the street and I play with them to, to, to warm up my voice. You can also look at the more complex words that might form part of your business or your research vocabulary. So maybe you don't necessarily have to say these words a lot during a day, but they might be really good words just to use to warm up your voice, your resonators and your articulators, the teeth, the tongue and the lips. You can also just pick up a book or a magazine and read some of those words aloud with the same essential technique, slowing it down, exaggerating it, feeling all of the different sounds, and then slowly speeding it up until you get to speech level. Warming up your keywords is especially helpful if you speak too fast or if you mumble. So notice how everything is good for mumbling. So if you speak too fast, having a better sense of your keywords makes sure that you're actually moderating your pace because your body, once you feel the sounds of speech, it wants to keep doing it. So when you then say those words, it's going to be clearer and it's going to slow you down. Keywords are also very important for real communication, which we're going to get to in just a moment. But finally, when you're using keywords, all those kinds of words that I described in your everyday work, you want to make sure that you take the time to say them clearly so that people can hear them, can understand them, and they can retain the important things that you want them to remember. So warming up your voice is really easy to do. Um, these are three different techniques that are very effective. And 
as I said, you can really do them for just five minutes a day and you'll see results. The point of warming up your voice is that you're building vocal awareness and vocal richness. Having more awareness and more richness is going to create a more engaged way of speaking that feels better to do and that sounds better to your audience. If you really want to see some real improvement, I would do all of these warm ups every day. If you can't do them daily, then at least do them on the days where you have important meetings or important presentations, because then you'll be fresh and you'll be essentially warmed up to actually make sure that you can hit all of the important things that you need to communicate. You'll absolutely see more continu continued and consistent improvement if you can practice some kind of vocal warm up every day. Five minutes is, is, is enough to see consistent change. So warming up your voice overall and becoming more aware of what your voice feels like is going to help you when you're speaking to people in person. It's going to help you in interviews, in meetings and presentations. It's going to help you a lot in Zoom meetings or conference calls because you're going to be kind of slowing everything down, um, not in a, in a labored way, but everything's going to just become easier to listen to because you've got a little bit more awareness of the sounds of the speech. It's gonna help you when you speak on the phone as well. The reason that it helps is um, that the vibrations of the voice actually help you to feel more confident. If you can feel that there's something happening here, it just improves your confidence. It helps you feel more present and it allows you to be more able to communicate your intentions. And again, just like the breath, it relaxes you and it energizes you. If you just think about those uh, massage chairs that are all vibration, your voice is vibration as well. So if you can tune into that vibration, it has the same effect of relaxing and energizing the body. The bottom line though, whether you're doing a vocal warm up or not, speaking clearly with an awareness of the sensation of your voice helps people to remember you and, and what you have to offer. So thus far, we have looked at presence and posture. We've looked at feeling and finding a better way of breathing. We've just explored speaking skills through uh, exploring a few different vocal warm-ups. And now we're going to look at communicating to connect. So this is about engaging in real communication. This becomes much easier once you have a better sense of your voice and your body, because then your voice and body are there to serve you when you need to communicate. So communicating to connect. This is, again, it's engaging in real communication. Now, real communication, if you really break it down, is about eye contact and genuine interest. If you're always curious about what you can learn from the people that you're engaging with, then you're going to be an interesting person to be with. Think about how they can help you, but also how can you help them? What is the purpose of the communication and what is your desired outcome? These are just important things to think about as you're kind of uh, building your awareness of communication. So where does real communication begin? Well, it begins with eye contact. Eye contact is where we establish trust. Making easy and relaxed eye contact puts people at ease, but there is a balance. You need to make sure that you're not just staring people down. You, you, want, you want there to be easy eye contact. You also don't want to never look at someone because then it, it's difficult for them to trust you. They don't, they don't know who you are or why you're there or you know, it might not seem like you're being really authentic. So the quality of your eye contact is really important. And for this, I use a really simple technique called smiling with your eyes. So you always want to start with a little smile in your eyes. The tiniest bit of smiling in your eyes is an invitation to other people to listen and engage with you. 
when you smile, even just with your eyes, you seem more friendly and trustworthy. You are more able to access the physiological pathways to clearer, more open and enjoyable speaking. So that's right. Smiling with your eyes actually improves your voice. And I'll show you how that happens in a moment. Um, but the technical reason for that is that when you smile with your eyes, the muscles that engage are actually creating a ripple effect that open up the soft palate. So the soft palate is that squishy part um, at the back of your um, the back of your hard palate, the back of the roof of your mouth. And when that lifts, it creates more space for vibration and sound waves to move around. So it actually improves the resonance in your oral cavity. So how do you do this? How do you feel smile in the eyes? Well, it's really, really, really simple. Think of something that you enjoy. Think, think of something that you love, a person that you love, a place that you love. And when you think about it, you might feel the muscles move around your temples and into the scalp. And that's pretty much it. That's smiling with your eyes. If you're really astute, you can actually feel the movement inside the mouth of the soft palate lifting. And a good way to test it is to just kind of erase all of that and just kind of drop the muscles of the face. And then think about that person that you really love or that place you love. And you'll feel that little, that little shift of the muscles in the temples and into the scalp. As I said, you might even feel that little lift in the soft palate. So you're all in your own space. I, really, I encourage you to try this right now. So what I want you to do is I want you to, we're going to do something really simple, like introducing yourself. So I might say, hi, my name's Amy Bleasing and I'm a vocal coach. Okay. The first time you say it, I want you to lose any expression in your face at all. Just kind of let everything relax. Go ahead and introduce yourself to yourself. And then I want you to think that little thought that creates that little sense of smile in the eyes and then do it again with that smile in your eyes and see if it feels different. And for those of you that aren't in a situation where you can play with this right now, I'm going to do an example of it for you. Okay. So here's with no smile in my eyes. Hi, my name's Amy Bleasing and I'm a voice and speech coach. Smile in the eyes. Hi, my name's Amy Bleasing and I'm a voice and speech coach. It feels different. It feels brighter and it feels more energized, which is what's really cool about this. It's so simple and it's so effective. Having a little smile in your eyes helps your voice sound cleaner and brighter. It helps people feel at ease and trust you. It helps you engage as a listener. If you de-energize your, your eyes, you are gonna drift off or get caught uh, in boredom or disinterest. And it helps you feel more engaged. So we're running out of time here. So I wanna just move through the next couple of things that we need to look at um, in terms of real communication. So genuine interest is really important. Um, thinking about what you can learn from people and what you have to offer them. Intention and mindset are two other things that are really important. So having a really clear goal of what you want people to gain from what you have to say. Um, this helps you energize your voice. It helps you have more organic body language. It's just like when you're talking to friends, you're not thinking about what you're communicating, but you're more at ease. So when you're in a, a, a business situation or a professional situation, just remembering that if I have a clear goal, I can get this done and I can, I can really uh, communicate clearly and effectively. And the other one is mindset. So just making sure that you're not investing in negative self-talk, that you're actually, um, Enjoying the fact that you get to speak about the thing that you love, that you are prepared, and all of that stuff helps you to just calm everything down and communicate clearly. So the key things that I'd love for you to take away today are these, these techniques for breathing easily and engaging good alignment, for warming up your voice and building good vocal tone, enjoying speaking, communicating with a smile in your eyes, engaging people with real interest, being present and engaged when you speak, having a clear intention and improving your mindset. All of these things are gonna really help you get started with improving your ability to communicate. 
So I want to say thank you so much for everyone. Uh, I'm sorry that I took up so much time. I, I got excited. Um, but this is me, Amy Bleasing. I am a vocal coach. Um, I am available for corporate training in a number of different areas related to public speaking and speech. You can visit my website if you'd like more information from me. Um, you can connect with me there, join my mailing list. Um, I'm going to defer to Karina quickly just to see if we have any questions at the very last minute. Um, thank you, everyone. Absolutely. Thank you, Amy. That was fantastic. I know I've learned a few new techniques. Um, we do have a couple of questions. If any of you need to leave the webinar now, please know that we will be sending out Amy's presentation um, to all of you within the next couple of days. So um, please watch for that. Um, the questions, we've had one question since the very beginning uh, of the webinar this, uh, today. And um, how can we optimize our Zoom meetings posture Etc. Thank you. Amy, I know you've talked about this a little bit, but yeah, so it's really, it's not that different from being in person. Now I've just, I've just spent the last six weeks doing a lot of online teaching. The things that I notice that I do that I need to give myself little reminders about, uh, I lean into the camera and so I lose that good posture and I start to, to uh, create that, what we call hyperextension in the throat. So I've even got here today, because I'm so, I, I get into this little habit being on Zoom, I even have a little note for myself, sit up, just to remind myself to keep that nice alignment, keeping on my sit bones. And as much as you can, uh, aiming to the camera when you're speaking extemporaneously or in a meeting, um, in Zoom, you can actually hide yourself. Um, you may already know that, but you can hide yourself and that's gonna stop you from looking at the picture of yourself while you're talking and help you to actually just connect with people. Um, also, the vocal warm up is really helpful for Zoom because I've even found there have been days when I've sat down to teach and I've gone, I haven't done a vocal warm up and my voice is all craggly. And so I need to take that five minutes to just do some humming to clear everything out and make sure that I'm present. The other thing with Zoom is it can be really exhausting. So taking time away to get up and do some stretching. If you know any yoga, that can be really beneficial just to kind of reset the body, do some breathing and then coming back to, um, to the screen. They would be my top tips. Great, useful for everyone on, on the webinar today, I'm sure. Um, second question, sometimes I feel like I nod my head whenever someone is speaking and looking at me during a meeting or presentation. Does this make me seem unprofessional? I don't think so. I think it's actually when you read about body language, that's one of the things that they actually tell you to do because it shows that you're engaged. So as long as you're not like this the whole time, I think it's fine. Um, you're essentially, what you're doing is you're punctuating the thoughts of the people that are speaking. And it's almost the same as going, yes, I understand. Ah, yes, I'm with you. Okay, great. So as I said, as long as it's not a consistent stream of nods, you should be fine. Just, just be aware of it. Great. <laughs> That's good to hear because I do the same <laughs> thing all the time. Um, okay. And um, our last question for now, in case anyone else has a question, um, what are some tips for recovering quickly once you have made a speaking flub? Uh, smell the flower. <laughs> Honestly, take a breath because it's in taking that breath that you allow yourself to reset. Know that you're human as well and the people watching you are human. So if you make a mistake, you can always just have a, have a quick moment to acknowledge it. Oh, I'm sorry, that wasn't what I wanted to say. Or I'm gonna try that again. You know, using a little bit of a sense of humor to, to get past those moments can be really helpful. But if it's something that makes you kind of panic Taking that flower smelling breath. Okay, I'm gonna start again. Or what I, what I wanted to say was, it just allows you to reset a little bit. But I think it's important to just acknowledge that you're human and we all make mistakes and it's okay. I made a couple of mistakes doing this today. It's okay, we're human. Um, breathing will be helpful though. Great, good, great question. 
Um, and how much is too much eye contact during an interview? I think that if you're paying attention to it, you will feel it. You'll notice if someone's getting uncomfortable, if you can see that the other person is getting a little bit uh, agitated or if they're starting to avoid your eye contact, then you've probably gone a bit far. I think it's important, particularly when you first meet someone, when you're introducing yourself, when they're introducing themselves. But then it's about being relaxed, I think, and, and connecting with them, particularly if, they, if you're asking them to respond to something. You want them to feel like you're listening, but you also don't want them to feel like they're being watched in their response. So having a balance of making eye contact and then just listening, and then making eye contact and then just listening, I think is, is a good balance. But usually you can feel it. If you're, if you're thinking about it, you can usually feel it. Okay, I believe that's it for questions um, for now. And I again wanna thank Amy Bleasing again for joining us today and for giving such a great presentation. I know that there are several techniques I'm going to take away from it. Um, and thank you everyone in the audience for joining us today as well. Again, we'll be sending out the presentation within the next few days and um, please join us for future webinars. Thank you everyone. Thank you.